Hi everyone, Ben Taylor from Ledger Domain. Thanks for joining. Everyone has been touched in some way by the COVID pandemic and we hope you and your loved ones are getting through it okay. A recurring theme today will be drug supply assurance, which as a result of this virus is more important than ever before. My co-founder, Dr. Victor Dodds, usually focuses on leading our team to build great products, but once a year, we open the factory for a tour. First, let's frame the team's progress against the challenges you've set for us. Our kit chain project for the Clinical Supply Blockchain Working Group, which included Biogen, Pfizer, Merck, GSK, Mark and UPS, Thermo Fisher, Almac, UCLA Health, and IQVIA, was an XML-based advanced ship notice solution on Hyperledger Fabric. For a more recent Bruin Chain pilot, UCLA and Biogen established the processes they needed to deliver verified life-saving drugs to the patients that needed them, while highlighting approaches to meet upcoming regulations such as DSCSA. Both of these real-time auditable transaction platforms are powered by the DocuSeal framework, Selvage App Server, and Oraculous Interoperability Service, all running on top of the Hyperledger fabric. These products transform the proven person-to-person fabric project into a multi-stakeholder supply chain platform. Victor will touch on Bruin Chain briefly before our team showcases some of the newer features we can deliver today. Leo, Will, Ben, and Rick together will extend out from our successful Bruin Chain app. Bruin Chain was more than the FDA asked for and certainly more than industry stakeholders expected, but it tracks only one drug, Spinraza, from one manufacturer, Biogen, at UCLA's enormous pharmacy. In order to ensure blockchain was truly enterprise-ready, we asked ourselves, how hard would it be to scan all of the approved 176,000 medications? How hard would it be to support the activity of 70,000 users? And as together we pushed to support the transaction volumes of the entire U.S. pharmaceutical supply chain, how fun would it be to crash some servers? And that's our goal today, to share some early, early learnings, get your reactions, and together highlight opportunities to collaborate and interoperate please drop your questions and comments into the chat channel, and we'll wrap up with a live Q&A session. So please join me in welcoming our blockchain visionary, Dr. Victor Dodds, to the main stage. Victor? Thanks, Ben. Today, we're going to talk about a few of our current initiatives and tell you how they tie together to solve some of our challenges facing the pharmaceutical industry in particular. First, we'll briefly cover our work on Bruin Chain, which was a collaboration with UCLA and Biogen as a part of an FDA pilot project. Next, you'll see our Scan Any Drug project, which we jokingly refer to as SAD, an app which gives you the power to access a wealth of information about any one of 176,000 drugs simply by scanning the package barcode with your iPhone camera. Uh, Finally, our Selvage App Load Tester project, which is part of an effort to profile our whole system find bottlenecks, and drive performance improvements. In three years, under the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, the U.S. pharmaceutical supply chain will be brought together by an electronic interoperable system to identify and trace prescription drugs as they are distributed throughout the country. Selected by the FDA for the DSCSA Pilot Project Program, UCLA Health and Ledger Domain join forces to create Bruin Chain, a blockchain-based solution designed to track and trace changes in drug custody, perform mandated DSCSA checks, and interoperate with trading partners. Bruin Chain was tested with real data in a real-world setting at one of the busiest hospitals in the United States. From the receiving bay to patient administration, caregivers scan the drug's unique 2D barcode using the Bruin Chain mobile app. This makes it possible to track the drug through the pharmacy at the stockroom level with every transaction logged on the blockchain. During its journey, the drug passes a series of checks until it's administered to the patient. Bruin Chain is also designed for exception handling. Under DSCSA and GS1 requirements, Each barcode contains important information about the drug. When caregivers scan the barcode, this information is automatically extracted. New barcodes are routed to a trading partner for verification, and the drug is held back from being administered. At any time, the prescriber can view the progress of the drug through the pharmacy into the clinic. The trading partner can either verify the drug or indicate that there is a problem, such as a potential counterfeit. Trading partners can be provided with a real-time data stream on where their drug is and when that unit has been dispensed and even administered. If a drug is found to be suspect at any point, it is stickered and physically quarantined. If human review reveals a high risk of illegitimacy, Bruin Chain provides all the data needed to notify the FDA and trading partners. If the drug is verified as authentic, the prescriber gets a green light and can now administer with confidence. Beneath the surface, Bruin Chain passes messages and tracks changes in custody between six different roles. Here's a quick look at the system architecture, including the DocuSeal framework and Oraculous notification service. By combining blockchain with commercial off-the-shelf technology, 
Bruin Chain makes it possible to track and verify drugs in a busy hospital or neighborhood pharmacy. With Bruin Chain, doctors and pharmacists have a powerful new tool helping them in their mission to get the right drugs to the people who need them. Now let's hear from Will about our efforts to scale from scanning one drug as we did with Spinraza and Bruin Chain to scanning 176,000 drugs. Thanks, Victor. As part of the SAD challenge, we scraped publicly available FDA and NIH data sets to get approved drugs, their information and package inserts, and special reports of extended expiration dates and drug recall data. Now all of that information can be pulled into the palm of your hand when you scan a drug. And why is this little app so important? Well, it's because it's a bridge of sorts. We're excited by blockchain because of what it means for privacy, security, analytics, and legibility in supply chains. But none of that matters if you can't easily tie real-world events back to a digital representation on the blockchain, and vice versa, pull information from the blockchain back to a user interacting with the real world. SAD is our draft of an easy-to-use digital physical bridge for the pharmaceutical supply chain. We wanted to prove to ourselves that we could build one to cover all DSCSA-compliant drugs out of the 180,000 in the FDA's database, and we're happy to share with you what we've built so far. For this next part, anyone with an iPhone can play along. Just go to ledgerpalooza.com sad on your device to download Apple Test Flight and the SAD app. And I have to say, this is all in test mode, so please double check before discarding a perfectly good bottle of Viagra when the app tells you it's expired. And with that warning, over to Ben Nichols to take a closer look at the app's functionality. Hi, everyone. You can think of this as an applet that does a few simple things. It scans a drug package, attempts to pull the information and check the expiration date, and then it checks other sources to flag extended expiration dates or recalls. We haven't yet done enough testing to ter determine which data sources are preferred, but wanted to give you an early look. This could be used as a standalone applet or embedded into a more comprehensive solution. If you've already downloaded the app, feel free to scan any prescription drug from where you are and send us your feedback, either by taking a screenshot in the app or by commenting in the chat. If you don't have any medication handy, check the Zoom chat or ledgerpalooza.com sad to see some example barcodes you can try. Hey Rick, can you flash your device on the Zoom screen and walk people through the app? Sure thing, Ben. Hi, everyone. I'm here to guide you through scan any drug. First, get a drug package out of your medicine cabinet and locate the 2D barcode. It looks like a square with a lot of static. Great. Now you can download and scan any drug onto your phone. Tapping the scan button will bring up the, camera's, the phone's camera. Just point it at a 2D barcode and the application will scan our database of over 100,000 drugs to find a match. Here you will see we have scanned Vimpat, which brings up the relevant information about the drug package, such as expiration date and dosage. Tap package uh, insert to view additional information about your drug. If you wish, you may return to the home screen and scan additional drug packages. Now, back over to you, Victor. Thanks, Will, Ben, and Rick. But in summary, you can now easily access 176,000 drug descriptions and package inserts on your iPhone. This in turn is something we can mix and match with your formulary and your brand to give your stakeholders the experience you want. So now that we can extend Bruin Chain to run every medicine, let's turn our attention to scalability and interoperability. Our Oraculous Interop service verified the barcode directly with Biogen. Once Biogen realized the savings versus adding their units to a blockchain, we asked ourselves, why not just solve the entire problem? How big could that be? Let's move on to SALT, our Selvage app load tester project. Ben, can you frame the discussion? Yeah, Victor, thanks very much. Um, blockchain may provide a single version of the truth, but today we don't know what the number of transactions in the US pharmaceutical supply chain is. So here's our take on the challenge. Zohar and Victor had the idea that instead of having manufacturers scan barcodes and load it onto the blockchain locally, they would already have the information in their traditional related, relational database. And we believe that we could fish it out. And that's exactly what we did with the Biogen um, TraceLink database. And we 
believe we can do this with other relational databases and roll it all up. That would save people a lot of effort, a lot of brain damage, and a lot of money so that you're only entering onto the blockchain at the end of the first hop. We call this oraculous since the relational database is acting as a blockchain oracle. So the question then is, how fast do we need to be able to run to cover that bottleneck? So we factored down from 5 billion prescriptions to about 1.5 billion saleable units, that's our best guess. And with 300 days a year, that's about a billion and a half down to 5 million a day. And that works its way down to 85 a second at retail. So our belief then is that if you've got three hops per package that you're looking at, 250 transactions per second. Tuck that away and I'll turn it back over to Victor and Leo to talk about load testing. Thanks, Ben. Dr. Leo Alexeyev is our lead on machine learning and data analysis. In order to do analysis, Leo ran Splunk on our system and gauged our transaction rate among many other useful metrics. Uh, you might know that performance benchmarks for Hyperledger Fabric see max transaction rates of 100 to 175 transactions per second on a single channel but there's an inconvenient truth here. The atomic blockchain transactions are not what a pharmacist would consider to be an atomic operation. Each atomic operation from the pharmacist's perspective is typically composed of several blockchain transactions, and therefore the expected maximum rate of, a, of pharmacist operations is several fold lower than the expected maximum blockchain transaction rate. Based on Leo's performance analysis, we devised several internal architectural changes to our DocuSeal platform, which provides the foundation for, for Bruin Chain. This refactor was done without altering any promise that DocuSeal makes for authenticating documents in a private and permissioned way. Leo holed up at Lake Tahoe through the pandemic while doing this analysis and lived to tell the tale. Thank you, Victor. Uh, as we know, blockchains can operate at planet-wide scales, but being massive is really not the same as being fast. And in fact, those two metrics can be at odds with one another. The trick is still, real-world hyperledger benchmarks are few and far between, and so going into this project, it was difficult to know exactly how good or bad the results would be. So I'm really excited to share some preliminary results with you today. And uh, let me start sharing my screen uh, to prepare to do that. Uh, but uh, uh, first, uh, let me elaborate on the point that uh, Victor was making. Uh, and that is uh, one reason that performance uh, is a tricky problem uh, is really the, uh, the hidden complexity of the business logic that's involved uh, in order to guarantee data accuracy, consistency, and traceability, we need to examine many pieces of information. For example, when uh, pharmacist Will scans the Spinoza, uh, the server has to check if it was in the system, where it was last, who is scanning it now and where, and really a lot of other state information. And this complexity grows quickly. So we may easily have a dozen or more backend operations to support one action within a user app. So while the live UCLA tests were great, the question in uh, everybody's mind was, what would happen if we had 10,000 users performing a scan every minute? Can we support millions or billions of transactions? Uh, we're all scientists at Ledger Domain with maybe one or two mathematicians thrown in, but uh, we figured that the best way to answer these questions was to perform an experiment. Um, so what were we measuring and how? The most important metrics to consider are the latency and the throughput. Latency tells us how quickly a given operation completes for the end user, generally straightforward. Throughput, measured in a TPS, transactions per second, tells us the number of concurrent operations uh, we can support. So I'm going to do something crazy here and uh, run a load test live in real time. Uh, we have instrumented a uh, uh, AWS virtual machine to run our system, um, set up some uh, custom logging, and we're using Splunk to collect a lot of our metrics and uh, analyze the data. It's really been of great help uh, as we're doing this. So I am starting to run the load test right now. And let me switch back to my browser and see, see what's going on. Uh, you see the Splunk control panel is showing the transaction per second rate growing to now we're at 80, 90. Um, uh, here I'm looking at uh, 
uh, uh, memory utilization and uh, uh, it all looks good. And uh, we can also look at the actual uh, detailed logs and metrics in real time. So here we are uh, looking at the uh, milliseconds that it takes for every upload action. Right now, it looks like we're running at an average of 4.45 uh, milliseconds. That's great. And uh, we can compute various uh, uh, figures for uh, burst and average transactions per second. Uh, let's go back to the uh, uh, Splunk app for Hyperledger Fabric. And we are, we are still ramping up to 350. 20, 300, so 330 transactions per second earlier. Now, keep in mind, as Victor was saying, uh, those transactions are raw hyperledger fabric transactions. So in this particular version of the backend, you have to divide by two to get to the uh, number of uh, end user uh, pharmacy transactions. Uh, so 320 would be roughly 160. Now, uh, ben mentioned the figure of our our target figure of 250, and given that we are running at pretty close to those numbers in a test environment, uh, I'm very optimistic that we will get to the target figures uh, in a short order. So uh, we're planning to get there by striking the right balance between uh, using blockchain for uh, data storage and using uh, fast, robust components uh, that's been uh, proven in practice for uh, other, other things. And uh, uh, we still have some room to grow in terms of optimizing the business logic to use blockchain more effect, uh, efficiently and in terms of horizontal scaling. And uh, the server is still running. It hasn't caught on fire. So let's see, uh, let's, let, let's see how long it can go at the, these transaction rates. And back to you, Victor. Thanks, Leo. Last year, this time, we were showing our DocuSeal platform which helps facilitate multiple organizations to collaborate and meet the privacy and regulatory requirements of the 21st century. Today, we've shown you some of the specific applications we're building on top of DocuSeal. Of course, all of this will get richer and better as we work together with you to drive process improvements, mitigate risk, and engage more stakeholders. Now, I'll hand it back over to Ben. Thanks, Victor. To summarize our session, we still have some kinks to work out, and we welcome your feedback but you've learned you can mix and match what you've seen today to create your own branded app. We're trying to make it easy for you to align a community around your purpose and your processes, map out your processes individual transactions, select your performance and your promises and ship. Due to time constraints, we focused on the commercial supply chain today, but for those of you who are working on clinical supply or cell and gene therapies, all of these features are directly applicable. You're now confident you can mix and match what you've seen today to create your own branded app. Thanks to Will, our designer Frank, Ben, and Rick, you now know you can scan the GS1 compliant barcode on any drug package, get an updated expiration date, check for recalls, and download the most recent package insert. And thanks to Leo and Splunk, you now know you and your healthcare stakeholders can track the entire U.S. pharma supply chain in the palm of your hand. Before we close, we promised we would address interoperability, but first let's define it. Traditional interoperability gives the right people the right access to the data they ask for at the right time. Modern interoperability takes it to the next level, ensuring that the right people know they're getting a truthful real-time update, that they're not being spied upon, and the bad actors can't jump into the middle of things. The interoperability we've articulated today is that of a single instance of blockchain interopering securely with the current relational technology to scale to the entire U.S. supply chain. This could provide a persistent real-time distributed historical record for the benefit of all stakeholders, and one could imagine that a not-for-profit organization could be formed to sponsor this initiative. However, we appreciate that some stakeholders desire a more heterogeneous solution, but hopefully we've solidified the idea that the single version of the truth that a persistent ledger provides is within our collective grasp. And with that, let's open it up to questions. I'm going to start with uh, Peter from GS1. And his question was whether SAD, in fact, is uh, scanning the GTIN, pulling that out, and pulling all that information out. And yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Um, ben Nichols, do you want to answer that question a little bit more completely? 
Yeah, when we scan the, um, the barcode, uh, we pull out all the information in the GS1, uh, and then we, um, we verify it against our database and see uh, what's in there. We get the serial number, the expiration, the lot number, and then we can also check um, based on that lot number uh, uh, for that NDC whether or not there's been a, either, like I said, a recall or um, an extended expiration. When it comes to uh, verification, Ben, um, what what were you think? Uh, what does this question encompass when it comes to uh, verifying? Well, I think that's a good question. So when we're answering Peter, we're verifying the database, but that doesn't include the verification that Oraculus does directly with the manufacturer of that particular serial number, which is a second operation. And that's what Bruin Chain did. But for SAD, we're not doing that because we don't want to clog everybody up. Hi, gentlemen. This is Peter Sturdivant with GS1 US. And thank you for your very interesting presentation. And thank you for your support of GS1 standards. We appreciate that. Uh, so, so furthermore, in my questions regarding verification, so you're really doing that. You did that with the Bruin Chain, but you're not doing that with others at this point in time. Is that correct? Peter, that's correct. Um, obviously, uh, we're looking to be able to interoperate with everybody at the right time, but at this point, obviously, we're still dialoguing with the other FDA pilot people, and uh, obviously, over, the FDA will have to state what they're looking for people to do, but uh, obviously, we stand ready to get involved and do some more work on that front. And your pilot also appears went, went beyond just the verification router services that a number of the other um, companies we're looking at. Is that correct? You know, we haven't seen a lot of the other pilots yet, and so I'm not entirely clear uh, what how they solved the problem, but, um, you know, obviously we feel like we had pretty good coverage of the challenge, and the question is, is how regulators and other participants see the ultimate challenge shaping up. I'm curious how you determine if a, a, a drug is a counterfeit. So, on the counterfeit side, obviously what you're looking for is a second serial number on a drug that either where that particular unit has already been retired or whether you're going to see multiple drugs with the same serial number um, in that uh, blockchain. Obviously, we don't allow multiple units with the same serial number on the blockchain, so that blocks it out right away. The other option would be it would be a completely fake serial number. And I'll say as an aside, all of the serial numbers that we supplied today for you guys to practice on were fake serial numbers. But if it's a fake serial number, then the, presumably the manufacturer, whether it's Biogen or somebody else, wouldn't verify that number. Does that make sense? Well, I'm unclear if, if somebody substituted a counterfeit product for a real product and then took the, counterfeit, took the real products and sold them in another market how you would determine that the product was a counterfeit? So there's a couple of answers to that question. And again, that's something that'll be very interesting to see how FDA and the other stakeholders interact with the other regulatory bodies around the world. What I would tell you is that our experience with our friends at Biogen is they actually manage this as a global database. So there's no angle to take it somewhere else and fake anybody out. They're very well organized around that. And in fact, we were verifying with their global group in Switzerland. Um, but to your point, our assumption is that the bad guys are also looking to verify their drugs. And so when it shows up in another jurisdiction and somebody tries to rescan the original, they're gonna run into another problem. I do think there's a terrific question and we'll offer a thought here. If you find two, which one do you think is counterfeit? And exactly. so our view is that, you know, if you want to be play it safe, you block them both. But again, these are, we're, we're merely a software vendor. We're not a, a regulator. We're not, not a company. So it's up to the groups to decide how they would want to play that. And it's our job to make sure we can adhere to that. Thanks. Hi, Ben. Salil Joshi here from GS1 US. Uh, I had a quick question on, uh, you know, overall scope. Uh, I see, it looks like you're uh, targeting the, in a way, the last mile, uh, right, uh, of scanning uh, the dispensers and the healthcare providers. Uh, is there uh, any plan of expanding that to the full supply chain? Yeah, I mean, our sense is that 
um, FDA is going to hold meetings to sort of get people rallied around and, and obviously share the various pilots. And, you know, obviously we're a small potato in the greater scheme of things, but in our case, we did focus on the last mile, but we went all the way back to the first mile with Biogen. And I think what Leo showed you today is that our system is capable of tracking today something on the order of a half of the US supply chain subject to variability and peak load management. Um, and so obviously we feel like we've proven out the idea that blockchain is big enough and robust enough to manage the problem. The big question that you're talking about, I think is the details of how that should work. And that's obviously up to the industry sponsored group to decide how they wanna see it roll out. And again, uh, Salil, thanks for all the great work that GS1 did on the data science side that really paved the way for us to uh, do a great job and thank you. Hi, this is Gopi from Merck. I have a question. So I downloaded in RAP. I was just going to look for some prescription drugs to scan. Then I realized most of the prescription drugs I have, are, a few of them I have is all orange bottles or orange tubes given by the pharmacy. So if you're targeting for the last mile and if this app has been is targeted for the patients to scan. Um, how realistic is the market where every patient is going to get the original barcode to repack information from the from the from the pharmacies? Um, that's question number one. Um, maybe we can start with that. Uh, if you can answer, what type of uh, realistic sure. uh, application? Gopi, I'm I'm happy to answer that one, and then you can ask the follow up. So. I'm not the world's leading expert on how FDA sees this, but for us, the way we read what they were saying is it's going to the dispenser, which is the pharmacy, that's the last mile. And then obviously in our pilot, we went ahead at UCLA and went all the way to the prescriber or the doctor, but not all the way to the patient. So you're absolutely right. Many patients are getting what we call amber bottles today. Um, and so clearly, um, you know, they don't have a 2D barcode. Again, as a software vendor, we don't have a strong view. We would love to see scan any drug be out there in the wild and support consumers as well. But that wasn't the main goal today. And that's not necessarily something that um, we believe is going to happen in the near run. On the other hand, Amber bottles, I do think, are slowly going away, and I think more and more people are getting the 2D barcodes. And Gopi, your follow-up? Yeah, the follow-up is, um, is this in direct response to the FDA pilot? Uh, did you have anybody participate? Are you just are kind of uh, have a technology which you are trying to demonstrate to all the participants of FDA pilot? Did you do any pilot actually? with some real participants like farmers uh, or you are just uh, basically um, a technology vendor trying to promote the technology? Yeah, so we were one of the uh, part of one of the 20 FDA pilots mm -hmm. um, and we were aligned with UCLA. They were the lead. I believe uh, Jess De Jesus, the uh, chief pharmacist of UCLA Health is on today. Thanks Jess for all your hard work. And we did in fact work directly with Biogen um, and Bjorn Rossner there, who is terrific. He's on vacation today in Switzerland, but uh, we'll be, uh, I would like to recognize him and Imran as well. Um, so yeah, live in a real pharmacy, in a real hospital with real patients. Um, and it was a, you can see our results in a peer reviewed journal in blockchain and healthcare today. And uh, I'm gonna ask Alex to put that link up. But uh, no, it was terrific. And I wanna be very clear, this was a team effort. Um, and uh, we got a lot of input from GS1, a lot of help from FDA, Connie and her group. And it was, uh, it was very, very helpful. And I know you guys worked hard at Merck as well, and we look forward to comparing notes. Thank you. But Ben, I think that question that was just brought up is very appropriate because as you're aware, the Drug Supply Chain Security Act defines the package, which is really the lowest saleable unit, and the homogeneous case for the serialization. And right now, DSCSA does not cover 
uh, unit of use or dispensing. Um, so as you mentioned, it's to the dispenser. So it's really at the receiving dock of the dispenser, whether they're a retail pharmacy or a major healthcare chain like UCLA. Peter, I think your point is well taken. And again, uh, this is a, a comment I'm gonna dodge. I don't think you framed it as a question, so I'm not gonna comment on it, but yes. Okay. Clearly people are looking for uh, people above our pay grade to determine exactly how to you know, manage these things. A good example that many of us think about is how do we handle white bag products where they're pre-dispensed offsite and then they come to UCLA. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's, there's a whole lot of corner cases to go through and I don't know that DSCSA obviously has been you know, fixed in its final form and we'll see how it works. But again, it's our job to show what's possible and uh, they can figure out what's desirable. Right. And, and so your application, again, it's, it has the ability to scan um, the two-dimensional barcode. I, it, again, we'd call that a GS1 data matrix, which is great. Um, you may be aware that the homogeneous case, the FDA allows either a linear or two-dimensional. So if a manufacturer is using uh, linear barcodes with the four application identifiers, can you still scan that or just the 2D? So that's a good question. We actually found some interesting corner cases in our work. Um, some drugs from UCB were a little bit different than we expected. Um, and so we do see people, you know, leveraging the linear barcode as well. Um, and so uh, right now we have the technology to do the linear barcode, um, but it's not necessarily something that we imagine will end up in the final product. But again, uh, the key thing here is to show people the possibilities and we can, you know, obviously work together with the stakeholders to get them what they need. Great. Thank you. Hi, Ben. Mark hey. Wagner from uh, Red Hat. And uh, I'm also chair of the Hyperledger um, Performance and Scale Working Group. So I, of course, have questions on performance, but I guess the basic one would be, are you using Hyperledger Fabric out of the box or are you making changes for, for performance reasons? I can answer that one. Uh, we're using vanilla Hyperledger Fabric. There's no alterations to any of the fabric code. Cool, thank you. And which version of Fabric did you use? This is Suma from IBM. Hi there. Uh, we're currently using 1.4 um, and we'll eventually upgrade to 2.x in the upcoming year. So I have one more question, if I may. Uh, what are your thoughts on cold chain uh, scenarios for the last month? And how do you think this might help? Or if, do you have any future plans on how you could expand this to handle those kind of scenarios? So uh, you're, you, you're asking about ahead. cold chain, the uh, idea of bringing temperature controlled uh, data into the blockchain? Mm -hmm. um, we are very big fans of obviously uh, linking up the Internet of Things data over time. Uh, what I would say, and this is just an editorial comment, is that at this point um, with COVID, there's a lot more interest in cold chain than ever before. There's a particularly high level of interest on the um, on the clinical supply side. So today we've mostly talked about commercial product and of course there is cold chain on the commercial side, but on the clinical side, it's super important. Right. And as people look to go to um, the, uh, the patient directly, that sort of data is gonna be really interesting. So I know that everybody has a strong interest in that. I'm gonna ask our partner, Greg Plant, if he has any comments to make. I, I would say your, your comments are absolutely accurate. There's been an awful lot of interest, especially as we start shipping direct to patient, whether it be cold chain or, or whether it be simple temperature controls, even for staple product, yeah. uh, largely because uh, stability is still being evaluated in a lot of the uh, experimental products that we work with. So yeah, there's been an awful lot of interest. Uh, the change over from uh, temperature sensors that are very end user dependent ones that require being uh, put into a USB port or, or some other approach uh, are becoming less interesting as a result. Moving over to ones that are Bluetooth enabled and capable of, of sharing their data more readily uh, becomes interesting. Uh, and also ones that uh, allow us to, to build that into an app. 
uh, rather than being dependent on, on it being shipped back or something. But again, all of these are considerations that are becoming more important. None of these are new. They're ones that have been in consideration for quite some time. Uh, but because we're uh, becoming more reliant on a patient to do things, reduction of that burden becomes important to us. Thanks, Greg. I will take a couple more questions and uh, then we'll call it a day. And thanks for your attention. Hey, Ben, it's Chris Moose. I mean, just great job today and great job on the, the pilot. Love how you brought together the GIS1 standards, the UCLA, Biogen, I mean, just all of it, great stuff. I'm curious, what do you think is going to take to move it forward if we play this out 12 months? I mean, you, you hinted at some of the things we might need the FDA to do, some of the things maybe industry might do, pharmacy, pharma might do. Kind of what do you, how do you think we kind of break the logjam that we're in right now? And um, how can all of us on the phone help? Chris, thanks for your question. If you guys don't recognize him, Chris led the IBM uh, FDA pilot and is a really terrific supporter of uh, the Hyperledger fabric community. Um, you know, I think, Chris, that there's a couple of issues that obviously everyone's thinking about. I'm sure people are looking for a little bit more guidance from regulators and other participants about some of these corner cases that we spoke about. Um, and I think that obviously what people are thinking more and more about is the interoperability story. Um, we tried to touch on that briefly. Obviously, we believe that interoperability starts with interoperability with the relational systems that are already in place, but there's also the piece of interoperating with the other blockchains that might be used by a variety of players. Over time, you could imagine blockchains on the API side for the looking at precursors. You could also look at blockchains that were run by individual companies. We know that J&J &J and Merck and people like that are also working with their own blockchains. So I would say that what we're looking at on the Hyperledger side, because that's our platform, is we can interoperate with other people that are using Hyperledger. But in addition, um, I think we're gonna see things like Hyperledger Cactus that allow us to interoperate with Ethereum and other systems as well. So I think this is only gonna get better. It's only gonna get easier. But you know, there's a lot of hard work ahead of us to, to build a robust community and engage all the stakeholders. And I'm gonna take a question now from Robert Miller um, off the chat box. And anybody else who has a chat uh, question, please uh, drop them in there. Um, how translatable is our work to meeting the requirements of the EU's falsified medicines directive? Um, Robert, that's a great question. Um, I think that it's a very similar problem in terms of its logic, um, but at the same time, there's enough differences so that you wanna make sure that you follow the process flow. And again, another shout out to GS1. Europe is really using the same um, barcodes that the US is using. It was a tremendous choice by the FDA to go with GS1. It made everybody's life easier. And these GS1 standards are gonna be in 144 countries. Um, and growing. And so it really, although there are some differences in process and cutoffs, uh, the core data science is really very similar. And obviously we're super excited about that core data science being further extended into the clinical side. Okay, I think we'll call it a day. Thanks very, very much for sitting in today. We really appreciate everyone's attendance and look forward to your comments. Please feel free to reach out to us if you want to talk about any of these issues more, obviously, when it comes to the performance issues and other things that we talked about. There's a lot to drill down on, but uh, we're very proud of what we've accomplished so far, and we look forward to interoperating with the rest of the community and getting some stuff done. And uh, again, thanks very much to Biogen, UCLA, and all of our partners on the Fly Blockchain Working Group as well. Thanks so much.